I'm Giovanna Cesarani. I'm an associate uh, professor of classics here at Stanford and the director of SESTA. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to the sixth SESTA seminar in our virtual spring 2020. And it's a real pleasure and as wonderful to uh, see you every week and to reconstitute uh, and in fact expand uh, our community in these weekly meetings. And it's also great to think today that I possibly you all are, or most of you are staying cooler than we would be if we were in our regular room on Wallenberg on the fourth floor, which can get really hot on hot days like this. Um, and, uh, but I want to also to briefly introduce today's talk, which entails introducing multiple speakers. So I'm introducing to you Mark Ajiyuit, Assistant Professor of uh, Digital Humanities in the English Department and Director of the Lit Lab. And also I'm introducing Steel Duris, Charlotte, Charlotte Lindemann, Nika Mavrudi, Nicole Nomura, Matt Warner, or, who are um, Lit Lab members and graduate students in the English department, Yi Bing Du, another Lit Lab member and an undergraduate here at Stanford, and J.D. Porter, who is the associate director of the Lit Lab. So this extensive array of speakers speaks itself to the essential collaborative nature of the work that the Lit Lab does, and the Lit Lab founded in 2010, is one of the core labs of SESTA and housed in the English department, the Lit Lab since 2010 has been a leader in digital humanities globally, revolutionizing the field of the age with its numerous innovative and just breathtaking applications of computational criticism to the study of literature. And I know that since the onset of the current global pandemic crisis, the Lit Lab has turned its sophisticated tools to research related to epidemics. And so it's a great privilege today to welcome the Lit Lab group to present and talk to us about the current research on writings and epidemics. And with this, I turn it to you. Thank you and welcome. Thanks for that, Jonah. Um, all right. Okay, perfect. Um, so uh, um, this project uh, began um, really in March. Um, it, it is a, a COVID inspired, but not a uh, not necessarily a COVID related project directly. Um, and it's it's had a few helpers along the way that we just wanted to, to call attention to. Uh, Matthew Krasinski provided some uh, some Facebook data that we used um, uh, in an earlier stage of the project, and Carmen Tong was involved in some of the thinking about newspapers as well. Um, so it's, it's, it is really very much ongoing research, um, and we're excited to hear uh, your feedback, um, take questions and ideas from you all um, right now. Uh, and you can you can see an earlier incarnation of the project on the Literary Lab website. Uh, we've been uh, blogging about uh, about the directions that we've been taking, uh, but right now we we have sort of uh, we have we have two parts. One of which is looking at historical epidemics um, using a, a large corpus of newspaper data, um, and the other uses um, a much smaller hand curated corpus of mostly novels um, to think about uh, literature that seems to relate to what we're to what we're thinking of as literature of social distancing. Uh, Mark, do you want to? Absolutely. So when we started thinking about what we could do, what kinds of interventions we as a lab could make into the ongoing conversation around epidemics that have become so constant and omnipresent in the world we live in at the moment, um, we, we thought about the ways in which that our methods that we've, we've in some sense used, in some sense pioneered in the literary lab, could help us understand how the ways that we talk about something or the language that's used to describe it um, can have uh, real world effects or can tell us ways about how um, various epidemics are, are affecting our social, physical, and, and, and cognitive well-being. So 
we started thinking about um, a, a number of different ways of exploring this, starting with the present and, and working backwards. And that's a really important aspect of this project, um, which is that um, it's not necessarily a historical project in that it's, it's rooted there originally, but rather the kinds of things that we learned as we started to explore pushed us back towards thinking about, about the past and, and the ways in which previous academics and the literature of previous epidemics and, and the literature, as, as we'll see, of social distancing can uh, shed light on the ways in which the conversations now are happening. And so this is where we started. Um, this is a graph of um, Facebook posts made by major news organizations, and this is the data that uh, Matchy supplied us with. And all I've done here is looked um, over time, um, and you can see along the bottom axis, um, these are the months of this particular year, and these are the top words associated um, with uh, the, the, the uh, coronavirus. Um, and we can see, or sorry, uh, yeah, with coronavirus. And so we can see um, how the language has evolved over time in this very rough and crude way. And this is just a, a word embedding model, which we'll hear more about, um, that, that allows us to examine the, the language of, of the corpus as a complete system um, and lets us examine what words are closer and farther away. And so over time, um, you can see ways in which um, various things have changed, the most notable of which um, is distancing, of course. Distancing was not something that was originally at all associated with conversations about coronavirus. Um, until February, until all of a sudden it, it started rising, becoming um, by March the most associated term with how we're handling this. So this kind of language transformation really interests us, um, but also makes us think of, of, of the other particularly linguistic affects um, or, or, and, and effects uh, that, um, that, that we can find and trace surrounding, surrounding pandemic. And so when we started to think about going backwards, um, this is the corpus that, that naturally uh, began to suggest itself to us. Um, the ProQuest Historical Newspaper Corpus, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, is, a, is a fantastic resource, um, particularly if you're interested in, the, in, in sort of uh, American historical news, um, or for us, just simply the way in which things were talked about um, in, in American history. Um, we, it's, uh, with the help of the library, we obtained a copy of this corpus. It's the the full text of over 80 American newspapers published uh, roughly between 1840 and 1995, although the actual dates are a little bit more capacious. We have some as early as the late 18th century and some as late as 2005. Um, it's over 100, 100 million scanned pages, uh, 40 billion words, roughly. Um, it's, it's 40 billion and change. It has geographical representation across the U.S. Um, it has both um, papers of record like the New York Times or the um, Chicago Tribune, um, but also also more local newspapers from smaller cities. Most importantly, it also includes um, newspapers from underrepresented groups, particularly historically uh, black newspapers. Um, it also has a slightly wider reach thanks to Glenn Worthy, who I don't think was able to make it today, um, who uh, was also able to put together a corpus of specifically newspapers west of the Mississippi. Um, so we tried to have as much geographical coverage. Um, it's very well tagged with metadata, uh, which identifies uh, types of information as well as uh, uh, types of, of, of piece. So it identifies articles, features, classified ads, etc. Um, it also has very good date and publishing information um, as well as um, as well as hand keyed titles. And so we began our turn towards the past once we started to realize that how we talked in new settings about these epidemics um, might begin to 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 suggest how 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 we can understand where we are today um, by, by starting to search for um, a number of different disease terms or illness terms from the past, um, including flu, both influenza and flu, um, polio under its guise of polio and uh, previously infantile paralysis, smallpox, and cholera. And so we, uh, to, to sort of give you an example of the kind of thing we were looking for, uh, this is one uh, that, that Nicole called our attention to um, when we were uh, looking at contemporary coverage of coronavirus, um, was this, this particular um, uh, turn of phrase that coronavirus doesn't care about um, usually some category of human division, coronavirus doesn't care about race, coronavirus doesn't care about your political affiliation, that was a big one. Um, and um, we started to ask ourselves, um, uh, 
okay, well, if, if this is a particular um, expression uh, for coronavirus, we've had a couple of a couple hundred headlines um, using this. What about um, other historical um, diseases? Are they framed as caring um, or as not caring? If coronavirus doesn't care, is it the case that like the flu was out to get us and it really, really did care? Um, or was it the case that like the flu didn't, you know, the flu also didn't care um, about a particular um, your particular political affiliation or whether you were from uh, the right side of town or the wrong side of town or so on and so forth. Um, and so we wanted to, to cast our net a little bit wider. Um, of course, research shows that this is in fact a, a fairly restricted turn of phrase. It's novel to um, coronavirus, um, but, uh, but we wanted to look at um, what historical diseases do. Um, and so we, we started with, uh, with the headlines from this, uh, this newspaper corpus um, because uh, the, partly just by analogy, the, uh, the coronavirus not caring phenomenon found itself mostly as a kind of um, pithy headline. Um, so we, we pulled all of these headlines. Um, uh, we pulled all, the, all of the headlines from our corpus and we looked for ones that had uh, those, uh, those eight disease terms uh, that, that Mark had uh, on the, uh, a couple of slides ago. Um, and as you can see, um, there's, a, there's a wide variety here. I pulled just sort of some of the more, uh, the more striking ones. Um, and uh, rather than just looking for verbs in association um, um, with, uh, with these disease terms, um, we wanted to get specifically at, and here our thinking is maybe influenced a little bit by an ongoing lit lab project on, uh, on the phenomenon of personhood, uh, but we were interested in personification of disease, or at least in cases where disease was being ascribed some kind of agency. Um, so we used Stanford um, Core NLP to do part of speech tagging, uh, and then to construct dependency parses um, for each of these headlines so that we could extract um, the governing verb um, as well as the subject. And so then we looked for uh, instances where uh, our disease verb is a subject. So in this slide, these are the the instances that are called, uh, colored blue. So polio won't wait, um, but not where polio is being used as, an, uh, as part of a compound adjective. Polio children have pre-Christmas party um, and not cases like, is it cholera? Uh, it turned out it was cholera. Actually, I think those are unrelated headlines. Um, and so this is what we found. Um, and uh, I, I've collapsed here the, uh, actually I haven't collapsed, I've just omitted the results for, um, for infantile paralysis and for, for smallpox, uh, which are uh, which don't work quite so well for this, um, for smallpox as, as two words, um, and, and as you can see, they're uh, they're similar um, similar enough, but with some, some important distant uh, distinctions. Um, scare is a is an important phenomenon, um, and I'll talk a little bit about this in a, uh, a slightly different context in a minute. Um, the, the phenomenon of smallpox scares seems to, to have been a thing that was, uh, that we don't necessarily see with polio, um, or a little bit with cholera. Um, uh, but broadly speaking, um, kills is, is high up on the list for all of these. Interestingly, not for smallpox, which does actually have a very high lethality. Um, it's also interesting that kills is very, very near the top of the list uh, for influenza. Um, and I mean, our corpus does obviously include 1918. Um, and, uh, and the 1918 flu pandemic, but it also includes the many, many decades in which, in which flu is not. Uh, um, season, it's, we're talking about more regular seasonal flu. Um, there are particular adjectives that even just scroll, uh, or particular verbs that even just scrolling through um, these, uh, these headlines is it's relatively easy to pick out. Um, rages is a, is a major one. Um, I don't think sweeps makes the, oh, sweeps makes the top, uh, the, the top list for influenza, but it's common for the others as well. Um, um, and, and these numbers are just the, the raw counts for, um, for, each of these, um, uh, for each of these diseases. How often we saw the, this verb governing this particular disease term in a headline um, in one of these, uh, one of these newspapers. Um, so we wanted to, to sort of, uh, to treat this a little bit more capaciously um, so we did, uh, we produced some word embedding models of these headlines. Um, we, we did one per decade. And so this is a way of modeling vocabulary that allows for semantically meaningful measurements of distances between words. So for example, pants will cluster with clothes because pants are a kind of clothes, but pants among the words in the cluster of 
uh, clothing will be one of the ones that is closest to legs and hips and feet and things like that. Um, and there are a few caveats about this. Um, the first is that the way that these models are produced doesn't necessarily allow um, for easy comparisons between models, so in our case, between decades. So though it's possible to measure, to, to produce a metric distance between um, pants and feet, for example, um, it's not necessarily meaningful to compare that um, longitudinally between different models for different decades. Um, so instead, we're working on this uh, in a couple of different ways right now, but what we've done for now is instead of using the pre precise measurements, um, I've, pre I've graphed in this case and in several others, um, I've graphed the, the ranking of, um, of these terms among the top 250. So among the, uh, the 250 words that are closest in meaning to, uh, or in, in closest in meaning to cholera here, or closest in association to cholera, um, is Russia. And, and I, I pulled this one um, because Mark um, highlights Russia uh, in a slightly different context a bit later, uh, but a, a more meaningful example um, might be one of these. Um, so these are uh, among the, the more important uh, associations for smallpox. Um, starting in uh, 1880 um, and 1870 for the, the case of epidemic. Um, and what you can see here is that there, uh, both of these terms are quite close in proximity to smallpox. Um, most of the smallpox coverage in the 20th century um, has to do with small outbreaks. Um, and so I think a lot, a, lot of the, a lot of the headlines are something like um, a certain number of smallpox cases in a particular location. And again, here we're dealing with uh, an American newspaper corpus whose reporting is focused on um, largely outbreaks of smallpox in American contexts, although not exclusively. Um, and you can see that smallpox, that as smallpox declines in importance um, relatively rapidly, um, these terms drop out of the associations with smallpox. Um, and so the um, um, smallpox doesn't actually, uh, smallpox starts to become a, incre a vanishingly uh, rare term in newspaper coverage. Um, in, uh, it would be interesting actually to look at, uh, at um, very contemporary 2020 newspaper coverage, uh, but up until about 2019, smallpox did not make it into newspaper headlines all that often um, for the last sort of a number of decades. So you can see that decline here. Um, uh, you can also see declines for terms that are um, maybe a little bit less intuitive. I mean, I, that tells us that smallpox, the previous graphs showed us that smallpox declined in occurrence over the course of the 20th century. Um, this uh, tracks something that I think is a little bit more interesting, at least from a sort of literary lab perspective, um, which is the incidence of headlines around smallpox scares specifically. Um, and this was a, a, a verb, uh, smallpox scare, um, was a, was a, that's a verb association that we see here. Scare in this case is sometimes going to be, um, to be used as a noun, like smallpox scare in Cincinnati or something like that. Um, uh, but we also are able to, to track things that are, I think, a little bit more um, sophisticated. So here, and I've, I've changed, I've zoomed in here, I've changed the axes because these are all relatively important words. So flu enters um, our newspaper corpus um, in, 19, uh, in the 1910s. Um, prior to that, um, it's, a, it's an uncommon term, and influenza dominates. You can also see here um, uh, that there's an evolution of newspaper headlines away from influenza. Um, so influenza is a term that appears um, uh, not interchangeably, but in close pro is, uh, exists in some kind of proximity to flu. And, uh, and this is true um, if you look at uh, flu's proximity to influenza as well. Um, but around the 1950s, um, newspapers begin to shift um, away from the use of uh, the word influenza in headlines and towards the use of flu. Um, it's shorter. It is also suggests some things about changing uh, discourse norms in newspapers. Um, um, but you can also see uh, a parallel, uh, uh, a, a, a shift that I think is parallel, but probably not related. Um, which is that epidemic um, moves away from flu. It goes from being, I think it's the second for some, for three consecutive decades, it's, it's uh, the second closest term to flu, um, sorry, third, and then it, uh, even closer to flu, um, and then it drops off. Um, it actually, th this graph is a little bit deceptive because um, epidemic is not closely related to flu in the 1970s at all. So there should actually be a, a large valley in the, in the 70s here. Um, and then the uh, an uptick 
in the 1980s that uh, I'm actually not sure what the explanation for this was. There was a large um, swine flu scare in the late 70s, um, and it's possible that this is just the, uh, the lingering aftermath of that as it's um, being rehashed and considered. Um, it may, uh, this is something that we're still working on. Um, but you can see um, a new entry into the vocabulary of the flu in the 1950s that um, provides a sort of causal explanation for some of this drop off, um, which is that shots suddenly appears as uh, a near neighbor to flu in the context of the flu shot, uh, which first starts to become widely available in the 1950s. Um, and this word enters um, this, uh, this vocabulary at a, uh, at a pretty high importance. It's the fourth closest word to flu. Um, and it remains important um, for the remainder of, um, uh, it remains in close proximity to flu in headlines for the remainder of uh, our historical period and obviously also subsequent to that. Um, the caveat here, um, aside from the caveats about the, the problems with our model that we're still modeling, that we're still sort of working through, is that we're really only working here with headline data. Um, so I'm gonna turn this over to Mark to talk a little bit more about digging into the articles themselves. Absolutely. And, and the nice thing about the newspaper corpus is that we have not just the headlines, but the actual articles themselves. Now, these come with a few uh, caveats. Um, the OCR on the articles is not hand keyed. So we miss a lot by just having um, poor quality scans that have dirty OCR. But on the other hand, we have a lot of material. We identified around 26,000 headlines that had one of our disease terms in them. And so the next step in our project has been to sort of turn to the articles that lie under those headlines and see how the language of these illnesses are actually being used, deployed, and how that um, use changes and evolves as the illnesses that they represent evolve. Sort of what Matt is doing in the, or showed in the headlines, um, but, but in a more nuanced way within the articles themselves. And we're still at the very beginning of this research. Um, and so I wanted to show you with you a few preliminary results that I think point to a couple of deeper things. Um, so we specifically wanted to look at how different language attaches to our illnesses over time. Um, so for each set of illnesses, and we, and we decided not to go with a vector model for this for a couple of reasons that, that, that Matt has already alluded to. Um, vector models can be somewhat inexact, and especially as we're trying to align them over historical time, um, there are a number of effects that creep in that make us not quite as sure if what we're seeing is really just a variation in the model or if it represents um, these kinds of nuanced historical uh, uh, differences. And so we turned um, to, to an, a slightly older technique um, in that we really just wanted to look at the collocates of our individual disease terms. So over time, what words show up in the vicinity of smallpox, cholera, polio, and influenza and their, and their cognates? And, and how does that proximity change um, as we move forward. And so to test this, we did a couple of things. First, we went into all of those articles. We collected what words appear within a five uh, window horizon around each one of our terms. Then we assessed each one of um, those collocates, those, those associated words, and said, okay, does it appear close to this term more significantly than we would expect if it was just randomly distributed through the corpus. So for example, the word the shows up with all of our terms quite a lot, but the word the shows up everywhere. We only wanted to capture those with a specific a semantic association with one of our four illnesses. And so we did two different things to measure that. First, we used a Fisher's exact test to look at um, whether or not the connection was significant. And secondly, um, we calculated the pointwise mutual information and then normalized it. Um, that, that gives us a measure for how much information each one of our associated terms shares. So the, the easy example of this, um, sort of help you understand it for those who aren't familiar with it, is that words like queen and Elizabeth have a high pointwise mutual information. Obviously you can use the word queen without Elizabeth being present. You can use the word Elizabeth without queen being present. Um, but when you use them together, there's a lot of redundancy there. In an article about the queen of England, you're probably talking about Elizabeth. And the, uh, in an article about Elizabeth, the ruler of England, you're probably talking about the queen. Um, so the more pointwise mutual information, the higher that measure, the more information those two words share. And that we can measure this across time to give us an idea of how different languages come and go and, and change. So if you uh, move on, 
um, this is the table that we created, and I don't really want to spend a lot of time with it. I just wanted you to see what it looked like. So for polio, for example, the term lists the, um, the, the most significant words that we found associated with polio. The frequency is how often they appear in the vicinity of polio. And then the others just give those measures. The, the p-value of the Fisher's exact test, obviously, if it's below 0 0.05, we kept it as significant. And then we measured the um, PMI and the normalized PMI. Um, which again, the higher the number suggests, um, is, is more associated with, um, with the key term. So if you move on, one of the most striking things that we found, and I think the, the kind of thing that sort of frames what we're hoping this investigation uncovers, is, is this. So this is um, the, the, two, the association of two words with polio from 1935 to 1970. Um, and those two words are fight and vaccine. You can see that from 1935 until 1955, fight, which was actually the most collocated word, most important, significant word with polio, um, actually falls off. And it doesn't just fall off sort of randomly, it falls off sort of in proportion to the appearance of vaccine in 1945, which of course was um, all very much in the news as it was being developed, um, and then um, continues increasing through 1955 when it became publicly available. And what we see here in this trade-off, I think, is a really, really interesting thing. Um, the disease before the vaccine becomes sort of an invader, a foreign thing that needs to be fought off, um, foreign in terms of sort of bodily autonomy. Um, after the vaccine, that discourse disappears. As we talk more about the vaccine, it becomes medicalized. Um, it becomes less of this uh, opponent that's personified through the discourse of fighting and much more um, a, a condition that can be treated uh, medically. So this was uh, polio. If we move on to cholera, um, one of the interesting things about cholera that we discovered is, in fact, polio is foreign to the, to the bodily autonomy. Cholera is just foreign. Asiatic is by far the most associated term with it through, through the early years, from 1830 um, all the way through the turn of the 1900s. And in fact, once Asiatic goes away, as you can see that it does in the 1910s, it's not, it's not that we've suddenly recognized that cholera is a possibility here. It's actually replaced um, with specific places, mostly in um, Asia. Um, rather than rather than simply accepted as sort of a worldwide pandemic. So you can see that Asiatic is replaced with Russia, with Shanghai, with Manila. Um, and what's interesting is if you go to the next slide, um, this of course tracks with the outbreaks of cholera um, in, in a lot of these places. So for example, the early 20th century outbreak of um, of cholera in Russia um, is also associated with Asiatic uh, places from Shanghai with Manila, um, et cetera. Um, the discourse of cholera is very much a discourse of, of foreignness, of, of something that happens outside of the US. And finally, with influenza, this is the most mysterious finding and the thing that I have um, less explanation for. So throughout the, throughout the 19th and 20th century, there are a number of terms that, of course, are associated with influenza and the way that it spreads. Epidemic, attack, outbreak becomes very popular after 1925. Um, and you can see that, for example, um, the big uh, H2N2 um, outbreak in the 1950s tracks very nicely with the way in which outbreak peaks um, along with um, epidemic and attack in the, in the late 40s through 1955. What's missing, of course, if you hit the next slide or the next, um, is this. This, of course, is the 1918 through 1920 um, Spanish flu um, pandemic, the, the flu um, from which uh, most of our comparisons to our current situation comes from. And yet, it's at this moment that the language of attack, outbreak, and epidemic, um, certainly attack and, and epidemic were present very, very strongly before, all disappear. Um, and so part of our, our, our research here is trying to figure out um, what is the discourse here? Is this in fact sort of something that, that, that um, was not talked about as much um, in, in the news? Or what is the discourse? The, the, the real question that we're trying to answer is what is the discourse of the pandemic, of the epidemic, while we are in the middle of it? And it's interesting that it appears not to be the words that describe it as such. Moving on. Um, do you want to uh, describe our next steps, Matt? Sure, I can say a few things. So um, 
we're, we're as, as, you, as you can no doubt see, we're really in the early stages of this. Uh, and we just wanted to flag a couple of the directions that we're thinking about taking it. Um, so one of those, of course, is to expand uh, much of the work that we, we just talked about um, to deal with the full text of the corpus, um, rather than just the subset uh, that are identifiable by headlines containing these disease terms. We're also interested in widening um, our coverage, the sort of gamut of historical epidemics and diseases, looking at others. We're interested in looking at non-epidemic diseases as well to sort of see what kinds of comparisons can be made. Um, if you're familiar with, for example, Susan Sontag's work on cancer and tuberculosis, um, thinking about how diseases like, um, like cancer um, might offer points of contrast that could be um, could be informative here. We also want to dig a little bit into the metadata. One of the great things about this corpus is its extensive metadata. So we're interested in, um, in trying to do some work with uh, the location of publication and the particular, um, the publication that these articles appear in, trying to see how these discourses might vary from place to place and within um, a particular location, um, from publication to publication. Um, and we're also interested, so everything that we've talked about has been, um, has been done with articles that uh, have, been, um, uh, have been filtered uh, for their classification as feature articles, um, uh, which is a sort of top level classification um, used in this corpus to distinguish them from advertisements and from classifieds, and there's a few others as well. Uh, but those are the, the three main categories. Advertisements make up an enormous portion of this corpus, um, and it would be interesting to see um, what uh, the role of some of this language is in um, advertisement, especially in the, I'm thinking especially in the early, uh, earlier portions of our period. Um, but uh, that's a, um, an extensive uh, portion of the corpus that we haven't touched at all uh, that, that, might, uh, that we might take up uh, in future. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to the social distancing um, folks. Um, JD, do you wanna uh, show your screen? Yeah, so literature of social distancing. Um, this is our uh, fictional penguin book slide introducing the, uh, the concept. Um, this uh, part of the work that we're doing right now sort of came to us as a complementary component to what Matt and Ryan have been talking about so far. Uh, and it was an attempt to, uh, to take some of the same kind of urgent and, and contemporary contextual questions and apply them to uh, a form of media that we're more often working on in the literary lab, which is, uh, which is kind of uh, more traditional literature, more historically construed. And the part that we specifically turned to, Mark kind of pointed to it a little bit in one of the early slides was the rise of distance as one of the terms that goes along with coronavirus. That this is a big component of the global situation right now on kind of an unprecedented scale is the social distance aspect um, and specifically the way that a lot of people are confined to their homes or have very limited social contact with other people, at least in person. And this turns out to be something that literature has examined in great detail for a really long time. Um, there are many genres that examine this um, and we've, we never, we originally were calling it confinement. We're now saying social distance, but if you broadly think about things that deal with isolation, solitude, confinement, and so on. Um, long history there. And it engages with two really fundamental features of, of narrative. One is the setting in the sense that uh, these are texts that often deal with a very limited array of spaces um, and they're a different kind of space than you might see in, for instance, an adventure story or a, or a, or a more social novel. And the, uh, the character structure is different, just in the sense that you usually have more focus on a smaller number of characters. Now, we won't necessarily be digging into these per se, but it's just to say that this is, uh, this is a feature of literature that could operate on very fundamental levels when it comes to the text. And so our questions were basically, you know, is, is literature that deals with this kind of theme uh, distinguishable from other literature, uh, usually along the kinds of trajectories that we usually look at in, involving textual features, um, and if it is distinguishable, how specifically? And then, you know, broadly, and of course, we're always thinking about this, but it's also always worth flagging, what can we learn from it? This is a, this is a period where the lessons of people who've gone through it before seem perhaps more salient than, uh, than they often do. Um, so our first step was to build a corpus, and Charlotte will say a little bit about that. Thanks, and apologies if you can hear the construction outside my window. I unfortunately can't silence it. Um, 
So in building the corpus, one thing we agreed on is that we didn't want to be overly stringent in our definition of what social distancing looks like in literature. So any narrative that contained one or more scenes where characters confined, isolated, socially distanced, broadly construed, counted for us. So this could be almost a complete novel like Richardson's Clarissa, where the protagonist is confined for a whopping 1500 pages, or it could be a brief scene with a minor character like the forgettable chapter in Portrait of a Lady where Isabel goes to visit Pansy in the convent. One question that we came to in putting this corpus together um, was where do we draw the line between social distancing and alienation? As JD mentioned, there are a lot of literary representations of loneliness out there. So did we want to count the feeling of being alone in the crowd as a kind of isolation? And the answer we ultimately came to is no. What we're looking for here is specifically, for lack of a better word, the coronavirus social distancing experience. So you can be socially distanced with a few other people, your family, maybe your roommates, but the important thing is that there's a physical space between you and the rest of the world. For this batch of results, um, we kept our examples to prose to keep things relatively simple, although we did come up with some really good examples from poetry and drama that we want to get into the corpus eventually. Um, we do have both fiction and nonfiction, and uh, the genre breakdown of the corpus is pretty interesting. I tried to illustrate it in a kind of sketchy way for you here with the book covers. Um, we have a lot of Gothic novels, so a lot of people trapped in castles or dungeons, a few mysteries. There's a fair amount of science fiction. Think of people trapped on spaceships. And then a number of adventure novels and sea novels, so people trapped on real ships um, or deserted, uh, deserted islands, remote locations. Um, all right, next slide, please. So our method of tagging, we did all the tagging by hand, um, which meant we marked where each passage of isolation begins and ends. And this also allowed us control over other features we wanted to um, pull out. So we tagged how many people were isolated together, what kind of location they were isolated in, whether it was a voluntary or involuntary confinement, um, whether it was the protagonist or a minor character, and a number of other things. And before I turn it over to JD with a few visualizations, what we found with these tags, I want to give a quick example of what a confinement passage actually looks like when you open the novel. Um, so on the previous slide, just as a little explainer, on the right-hand side here we have Jane and Bertha in Jane Eyre. So I'll be um, turning to Jane Eyre as a good example of how different confinement scenes can look. So there are two confinement scenes in Jane Eyre. The first confinement is, uh, this happens to Jane herself. So this is when she's locked in the red room early in the, early in the novel um, as a kind of punishment, as a child. And then much later in the novel, we get another scene of confinement, um, Bertha's maybe more iconic confinement locked in the attic in Thornfield Hall. So this first slide is the Red Room passage. And this, this scene gave us everything we expected to find. We got a ton of description of the room itself. The Red Room was a square chamber with a bed, curtains, windows, blinds, carpet tables, walls, wardrobe, chairs, mattress, pillows, footstool. You get the picture. At the end of the passage, um, when Jane has exhausted all of her descriptive powers, the novel turns inward to representing her thought processes. So I mark this for you um, in blue at the end of the scene. So with nothing else to do alone in the room, Jane starts to go over the events of her past and all the injustices she's faced in the novel thus far. So a rapid rush of retrospective thought washes over her. This is another thing we expected to find in confinement. A lot of thinking, remembering, revisiting the past, anxiously dwelling. Um, on what we could have done or what could have been done better. All right, next slide, please. So then our second confinement in Jane Eyre looks quite different. Bertha is the novel's mad woman in the attic. The wife, Rochester, keeps locked up in secret until fi finally at the climactic scene of the novel, Jane and the reader are brought in to look at her. Um, and we finally see the inside of the prison where she's lived in isolation for um, I forget how many years of her life. Um, so this scene opens with a very tiny bit of description 
when Jane and Rochester and the rest of their party enter the room. But after that, it's an action-packed dialogue scene, which is not what we were expecting to find in these moments of isolation. So Bertha attacks Rochester and tries to strangle him. He wrestles with her, eventually tying her to a chair. This, I would say, is as literal as confinement can get. But formally, it's a totally different kind of scene. Um, and I just want to flag that our corpus contains both. So back to you, JD. Yeah, so in the, in the tags that uh, sort, of, sort, of, uh, sort of showed the um, format of them, um, and what we wound up with was 81 distinct excerpts spread across 54 texts, most of which only uh, had one passage that we, that we wound up flagging, um, although the max got up as high as uh, four distinct passages. And for today's purposes, we want to focus on four main areas of results, because we're already able to tell some interesting things about uh, the, the corpus that we put together just based on our own uh, attempts to add some metadata to it. So first of all, um, we tagged the number of characters in each passage, um, because as Charlotte mentioned, we were interested in the sort of coronavirus version of social distance. There might be more than one person present. As it turns out, in the overwhelming majority of cases, we had thought of situations where there was only one person. So we're mostly thinking of one character at a time. Um, then there's a, a fair number of two and, and a few more with any, any greater number than two, which we just reduced to many in this case. Um, and, you know, this seemed well worth tagging and it was kind of confirmed uh, in going through Robinson Crusoe where he, he talks about how long he's been on the island. Um, but he says, uh, since Friday joined, he really ought to change the counter because his habitation had been quite of another kind than in all the rest of the time. So once it goes from one to two, once he sees that footprint, which is where I marked the end of the exit, everything changes. Um, we also tagged for gender because we suspected that had a significant impact on the kinds of uh, isolation that we were going to see. Um, and I think may have expected actually to get a higher proportion of women than men initially, um, but uh, this, is, this is how it shook out in the end. Uh, I should say that for, for the small corpus that we have so far, other refers to situations that were either ambiguous, like in um, uh, the pit and the pendulum where gender is never specified, or where there were uh, people of multiple genders present, um, expanding into uh, uh, other kinds of non-binary situations would be uh, a useful thing to do going forward. Um, and then as far as uh, some of the results that we've begun to see, if we also think about uh, some of the other some of the other areas that we tag, if the slide is ever willing to uh, to load up for us here, I didn't think this was that massive an illustration. Um, Boy, you can see perhaps in the preview, because I think you can see my whole window here, um, what we would what we would be looking at if it would load. <laughs> um, maybe I can pull up just the, the image real quick. Um, uh, sorry about this. Google is being finicky. You want me to try sharing my screen? Yeah, why don't you try real quick? I don't know why it's uh, it's uh it's slide twenty eight. Yep. Yeah, that looks like it'll work. Huh? Strange. Well, in any case, uh, this one shows uh, this is an, an alluvial or a Sankey diagram showing um, the connection between gender and and what we tagged as type, um, which actually sort of wound up in the end reducing to. Uh, location, which we hadn't expected, but uh, those two seem to be very closely related to each other. And uh, a few things jump out immediately, which is that if you have a male character uh, or protagonist, you get, you get prison. All of the examples of prison are men here. Um, you're more apt to get prison. Women are disproportionately allocated to houses and to rooms. And although uh, either gender may wind up in a remote locale, that seems to be dominated by men. If you go to the next slide, you can see um, we also tagged for whether uh, the isolation or social distancing was voluntary. Um, in cases where things are involuntary, as you might expect, you get a lot of prison, although you get 
something's going to other places. I should say cell refers to cases where somebody is trapped, but it's not necessarily a prison. Um, for instance, you know, being stuck uh, in, in another kind of institution. Institution actually referred mostly to monasteries, and I think in one case, a school. Um, and prison was fairly capacious. It does include a zoo on the planet Tralfamador in uh, Slaughterhouse-Five, so um, that went a number of ways. If you are involved in an accident, meanwhile, you're more apt to wind up in a remote locale uh, than via any other means of getting to a remote locale. And we can sort of link all these together, uh, turning the diagram into uh, something kind of like a sentence. He is saying, okay, if you're a, a woman, you're not very apt to be involved in an accident and thus not very apt to wind up in a remote locale. Um, we also know from looking at the previous graphs that if you're a woman and you wind up in, in social distance via involuntary means, well, we already know you're not apt to go to prison. So that means that a disproportionate number of these involuntary isolations and other situations uh, are, are highly, apt to be, uh, highly apt to be women. In other words, somebody involuntarily in a room or a house. Um, so this is just data that we're getting from our own tags without, without digging into it, but it enables this kind of uh, connective tissue to emerge. And then it also enables a kind of analysis that Mark is about to, to dig into. Oh, uh, actually first we have uh, some stuff that Nicole was able to dig into. Can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so one of the ways we're thinking about looking for the ways that we can distinguish the literature of confinement from other literature is to look at the ways that um, these words change in both their contexts separate and cluster extracts the things we tagged as moments of confinement as compared to the entire novel that we thought was thematizing confinement as compared to um, a corpus of, we call the Chicago corpus, a, a very large corpus of contemporary library holdings. And you can see in the extracts that prison is either substitutable for or very close to words like chamber, kitchen, apartment, church, and door, right? So these um, spaces that are more metaphorically prisons are clustering closer prison versus in the Chicago corpus where we see things um, associated with prison like jail, cell, prisoner. They are more standard understanding of prison, a dictionary definition perhaps. And um, so this is just but it should help us compare um, between extract novels and literature. Great. Um, and so we decided when we actually turned our attention to the things that we excerpted with the tags that, that JD has um, um, identified and that Nicole used for the, um, the model she just showed, um, we wanted to look at the differences across the various kinds of spectrums that we identified. That is, what kind of language is different when a character is isolated in one of the ways we have identified versus when they're in a social setting? Um, or if different characters are isolated, how is the way that females are, our female characters are isolated, different from the ways in which uh, male characters are isolated? And, and as JD pointed out, um, as we expand the corpus, as we move forward, we're really interested in bringing in alternate gender identities to, to include those into our understanding of how different kinds of identity and different kinds of confinement um, allow for different kinds of languages. So here we used uh, what are called most distinctive words, which allows us to say what words appear more often than we would expect in different segments of the text, either in um, isolation parts or in parts having to do with different genders. Um, so for example, um, one of the most striking findings that we made is that in places where um, is characters are isolated. That is parts of the text that we tagged as social distancing. Um, time and place suddenly becomes a concern in a way that it's not in the rest of the novel. Um, you can see in these tables, the leftmost column um, has the words that we identified as being particularly distinctive of these excerpts that, that involve some kind of isolation on the part of the character. Um, so weekend seasons, November um, from descriptors, of, but to, to actual 
um, days and times and dates, um, as well as places, stairwells, turrets, but also castles, cells, and kitchens and islands. Um, this, this interest in time and in place, in, 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 in chronology and in space, um, becomes a very, very concentrated way that characters who are isolated mark both the passage of the time and the places um, where they are confined. It's, it's, it's moving us from sort of a social space of event to um, these kind of Kantian categories of events um, wherein the character is sort of left without that social recourse. What's interesting is that these don't break down um, evenly across the different genders that we explored. Um, if you take a look, uh, the, the, the last column in each table sort of suggests what group um, these words belong to. So the group um, female characters, that is passages with female characters that we tagged as being isolated or, or um, socially distanced, they are confined or they are spending their time in stairs, um, apartments, kitchens, chambers, gardens, rooms, in houses, whereas the male characters, and this is this uh, follows from JD's alluvial diagrams, um, they're, they're not quite so confined. Not only can they go to the woods, the houses, the country, um, Rome and Paris, uh, but also they can go to Mars or the universe. Um, this is where males are isolated. So there's a striking difference between the way in which um, isolation is described for female characters and the ways in which it's described for male characters. Equally as striking is the fact that those time words that we saw as being indicative of moments of isolation are exclusively, exclusively um, consigned to passages with male characters. Again, um, female characters, women uh, characters are marked by being confined to these rooms, these houses, these apartments, and time is not uh, something that they're allowed to articulate. Versus males, who are apparently wandering alone in the universe, um, do in fact have this deep concentration on time. Um, JD? Yeah, this is a group uh, of words that we identified. I should say this is just the isolation passages versus the non-isolation passages, so not accounting for gender, but um, uh, they, they just stood out to us. So we have uh, tons of literary words, writing, uh, works, poet, literature, even, even paper and ink. Um, we have painting and paintings, we have philosophy, we have uh, music, we have, we have books. This was uh, poems and poem. This was essentially, um, although a few of us noticed this, to put together this list, I was just mentally walking around Stanford uh, look, and then looking up words associated with each humanities building. And it's very striking the extent to which these words that we might think of as the humanities show up as being characteristics, characteristic of moments when people are isolated. Things that had stood out to us as examples of social distance are just a, uh, overwhelmingly correlated with, uh, with being alone or confined rather than being in groups, which is interesting in a collaborative group like the Literary Lab to see, um, but may say something about what people envision themselves doing in these circumstances or possibly about the value of, of these activities toward helping somebody navigate these circumstances. So for our last experiment, we wanted to move from individual words to topic models because um, topics uh, are a way of sort of agglomerating those words together to help us understand something about the structure of the language that's, uh, that's identifying these parts of novels um, that are either isolated or social. Um, and so a topic model is an unsupervised model that allows us to look and say, what words are more likely to occur in these clusters in the same text. So it combines sort of a syntagmatic um, approach to understanding meaning um, with, with this modeling process uh, in which um, these things that, that are called topics help us understand um, how words cluster themselves, but also which clusters of words um, bring different kinds of text together by, by being present similarly in them. And so we created a 150 topic topic model for all parts of the texts, both the tagged and untagged parts. Um, and then we looked to see which of those topics that we created were significant. Um, that is, which ones were significantly associated with those that represent those, those excerpts that we tagged as associated with isolation, and which ones were associated um, with uh, social scenes in novels. And then we use that to create this TSNE plot. Um, that, that identifies the different parts of our corpus. Now here, each one of the dots 
represents a part of one of our novels that are either tagged for isolation in orange or in blue were not tagged. So they represent sort of scenes where the character is embedded in the social world. Um, and there's obviously a lot of mixing here, but it's quite striking that there's a very top bottom divide. That is, most of the social parts of the novels happen below this blue line in the bottom half of the graph, and most of the isolation scenes happen in the top. And this is actually a fairly surprising um, result for us. More so in that most of the isolation seems to happen in the same way at the top. That is, it's not particularly differentiated. Um, but across the bottom, we have one, two, three distinct groups of um, scenes of sociality in literature. And what this is beginning to suggest to us, although this is something that's very much ongoing in our debates about this project, is that um, despite the fact that we think of the novel as being by default a social space, it seems that there are different ways to be social within the novel, which suggests that sociality is a positive um, uh, uh, quality of a novel. That is, it's not merely that when a character is isolated, it's just removing the social from them. It's that the character exists and then either something that isolates them, this focus on time and space, or something that socializes them, as, as we'll see, uh, focus on a couple of different things. Um, it, that has to happen to the character to push it one way or another. And what's interesting is that each one of these groups is associated with a topic that I think describes a different way of being social. So for example, this group here on the right is associated with this topic. It's a little hard to sort of read it because you only have the top 20 terms of it. Um, but if you keep reading down, this is actually um, a, a topic of romantic attraction. Um, boyfriend, girlfriend um, up here on this list as does romance, etc. So one way of being social in a novel is to be involved in a romantic relationship. A different way um, is to be embedded in a family. This is a topic that has to do with family words, brother, sister, mother, family, father, etc. And finally, this much more nebulous group is associated with this topic, which suggests um, a certain kind of politesse. That is, this is a way of being in society, um, obeying societal rules, the things that one does within society, one exhibits good taste, um, one smiles, one spends time with friends, etc. So this is more of a, rather than a familial attachment or romantic attachment, this is just a generally um, sort of a social rules uh, topic. Um, and these three, again, suggest that there are, there are different ways of being social, and so that our isolation corpus, or, our, or the, the fact of being isolated um, within our isolation corpus is not simply a removal of these, but rather that, that, that authors need to put effort into making their characters appear within a social world. JD, do you want to finish us with the next steps? Sure. Um, so, uh... On the uh, on the social distance component, our next steps include uh, the obvious, which is adding more material to the corpus. Um, you know, we have an expansive uh, sort. We have a very large gate for things to get in, but we haven't uh, admitted so many yet. Um, so there's plenty of room to expand there, um, and uh, just uh, just adding to the tags and adding to the the kinds of tags. You know, there's a there were four basic categories that we presented on here, but it would be interesting to expand that to more. Uh, categories either about types of characters or situations or things like that. Um, we also are interested in looking at dialogue. Um, uh, you know, instinctively there's less dialogue in passages where characters are isolated. Dialogue is, uh, of course, a fundamental feature of prose fiction, um, and uh, we want to know what replaces it, what's taking up the space that it leaves out. And then representations of cognition and mentality, um, particularly if there is less dialogue, uh, how does the experience of being isolated or distant um, change the representation of characters' interiority? Can we zoom in on what's happening in the life of the mind, especially since we've seen how important it is in these passages, and distinguish it from what happens in uh, more social passages that involve cognition? Less, less mind reading and more introspection, perhaps. What does that look like? And, uh, yeah, and, and uh, we've mentioned Machi and, and uh, I, I can't remember if we've mentioned Carmen yet, but we'd like to just uh, bring up their names as people who have been involved in this project and, and really uh, contributed to it so far. Um, yeah. And I think that uh, takes us to the end. Excellent. Uh, we do have a few minutes for questions. Um, if you'd like to uh, ask a 
the presenters a question. I will ask you to follow the protocol that we've been using uh, from week to week here. If you'll hover over the bottom of your screens and make the bottom menu pop up, there is a little icon that says participants. Click into the participants window and a menu should open up usually along the side. Along the bottom, there's a little blue button that says raise hand. And if you'll click that button, um, I will moderate the question period. Um, so with that, are there any questions for the Lit Lab? I'd be perfectly happy to kick this one off. Um, I have a general question about um, to what extent you've thought about the, the anatomy of um, newspapers and how uh, headlines uh, fit into this, especially things like something appearing sort of quote unquote above the fold uh, and the tendency for headlines to be written by a different uh, sort of community of practice, if you will, than the people writing articles and whether that um, uh, is a factor in how you're approaching uh, the sort of significance of headlines, which are, I think, intended on some level to garner readership and articles, which are sort of to delve into a topic. And so there may be some disjunction there. Uh, anything, uh, anything doing on that front? Yeah, and Mark can say a little bit more about this um, as well. But one, I mean, one of the contexts we've, we've been thinking about this a little bit, um, is in one of the one of the ways that the metadata for this purpose is not um, everything that we might hope it to be um, is in its treatment of bylines, um, which are not systematic and um, they're not they're not a metadata field. Um, they're lumped into the article text um, if they do appear, and obviously very frequently they don't appear. Um, so we we've been thinking a little bit about that. Um, I don't know if we can necessarily do anything with bylines. There just aren't necessarily enough of them. Um, but it gets in some ways, I think, at uh, at some of what you're talking about. Um, and, and I mean, our next big step is really just to extend um, a lot of very similar stuff to what we were, what we have been doing with the headlines to the articles. Um, and um, part of that is about sort of producing a more robust analysis. But part of it, I think, is also going to be about looking for um, distinctions. Um, so, I mean, when we were playing around with the, the sort of like the coronavirus example of coronavirus not caring, um, it's easy to find articles where that's a headline. Sometimes that appears in like sentence one of the article. Um, but outside of the kind of like um, the, the clickbait, the headline, the lead, it doesn't really appear. Um, so we are interested in, um, I think, trying to track, um, especially when we sort of look at some of these um, more fraught or more emotional um, kinds of um, syntactic construction, um, thinking about like, do, are, they, are they being driven by their appearance in the headlines versus, you know, is the flu more likely to kill in the headlines than it is in the body of the article? Perfect, thank you. Nancy, I see your hand. Uh, I'm going to unmute you now. Where'd you go? Sorry, my computer is being a pain. Go ahead, Nancy. Hi, thank you. Thanks. I've really enjoyed um, this entire presentation. Um, I am fascinated by the association of uh, the terms surrounding the, the terms about isolation with men with gender of um, male and female. Uh, and I'm wondering if you thought of looking at so this is sort of the terms surrounding isolation uh, that describe male and female characters. But have you thought of breaking it down in terms of the gender of the describer, like how male and female writers describe male and female characters? Well, we haven't uh, we haven't marked that yet, but that's a great idea. Um, and I, I could actually envision two levels uh, for that to happen on one of which is is the gender of the author, um, and we have. Uh, we have that metadata in various places, so it shouldn't be too hard to link. It's also a small enough corpus that we could go through and mark it. Um, and then the other, the other factor that could be really interesting is the gender of the narrator. Um, you know, a number of these, it, it, it will tend to overlap. Um, a number of these are in the first person, and when they're, they're not, when, they're, when their focalization is like third person limited or something like that, Generally speaking, the person in the isolation passage, it's kind of a Robinson Crusoe scenario. It's the, also the person who's isolated, but not, not inevitably. And it would be, it would be pretty interesting to think about um, 
about that relationship as well. So that's a that's a great idea. That's definitely something we can explain to. Thank you. I would just add to that by um, by the fact that this dovetails really nicely with some of the other work that 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 both we've done at the lab, but others have done that show um, real disparities in the ways that authors of different genders sort of um, treat characters of different genders. So, I mean, the big, the big takeaway from most of those projects is that um, male authors don't typically write female characters, or if they do, they don't, they don't make female characters talk. Um, the the, the dialogue across, um, across all of the different gender categories in, in female authored books, or books authored by people who identify as females, um, are, are much more evenly spaced versus uh, books authored by people who identify as males tend to just feature men talking. Um, and I'm, 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 I'm interested oh. by your question because we have really haven't gotten there yet, as JD said, but I'm fascinated to know if that corner sort of capaciousness um, where men are sort of trapped in the universe thinking about time um, has to do with that disparity um, as well as, as, well as the, the social codes that sort of force characters to act um, or be trapped in particular ways. That's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, there seems to be a lot there to um, explore. Thanks, Nancy. Any more questions for our speakers today? All right, then I will remind you that next week I will be joined by Rachel Medora and Evan Kim to talk about the Traveler's Companion International Currency and Mileage Conversion 1550 to 1650. Please join us at this time next week uh, to hear about their work. Um, and let's thank all of our presenters today. Thank you so much for coming out to join us and talking about your work.